Hello. My name is Bill Masson. I'm an engineer with William H. Smith and & Associates and located in uh, Lander, Wyoming. And uh, this is a presentation on surveys by UAV or UAS, which uh, are politically correct terms for drones. And that's what we're going to be calling them from here on out is just drones. Before about 1980, surveying really hadn't changed much in the last 150 years or more. Um, the instruments were largely the same. They they performed the same duties. Um, they got a little more precise, uh, but and the techniques became a little more refined. But essentially, the practices were unchanged. Um, a surveyor from the early 1800s would have very little trouble taking an instrument from the 1960s and doing the work with it. Towards the end of the 70s, a new instrument showed up on the scene and uh, that was about the time I began my surveying. It was uh, That instrument on the left was one of the first ones that I was introduced to um, that was an EDM electronic distance meter um, with that it became possible to measure long distances very accurately and remotely by light and that revolutionized surveying um, being able to measure distances without actually traversing the ground um, changed the strategies that were used during surveying and, uh, and the practices dramatically. About a decade later, another technology arrived on the scene that was uh, GPS. And uh, that once again revolutionized surveying. Um, this made it possible to do the surveying tasks without depending on points that were intervisible from instruments. Um, the only thing that you needed to be visible to is the sky where the satellites were and that was a, a profound change in the strategies and, and practices um, that define surveying and are in use today and uh, they're still changing. I can neither confirm nor deny that I know that guy, by the way. And now we've got the next revolution in surveying, and I'm very fortunate to be a part of that too, and that is uh, drone surveying. This is the star of our show. This is the equipment that we use. Since Fly EB, it's uh, built in Switzerland. That's why there's a picture in a Matterhorn in the background. And it's a very specialized little airplane. There's a few factoids about the airplane. It's got a wingspan of about 38 inches. Nominal mission takeoff weight is about one and a half pounds. So it's very, very light. Nominal endurance is 50 minutes, although environmental conditions can affect that. Um, temperature and particularly wind will shorten that endurance. It cruises at uh, 22 to 28 knots, which is about 25 to 32 miles an hour. Maximum cruise or maximum speed of 49 knots. And you need a pilot's license and an FAA Section 333 exemption to use this commercially um, or any other commercial use of drones. A pilot's license and a 333 exemption is required. Um, there's also other airspace and, and uh, FAA regulations that must be adhered to. So how does it work? 
Well, I tell people that it's a mixture of calculus, voodoo, and unicorn tears. But the real answer is it's a little more complicated than that. So the EB uses a sophisticated automation software package, uh, two a two a telemetry and remote control system that's uh, talks to my laptop on the ground while it's flying, and a high resolution onboard camera, together with an onboard GPS uh, positioning system to produce geographically corrected stereo ortho photos. After the flight, the positioning data and the photos are downloaded and imported into a post-flight processing program that performs the photogrammetric calculations and uses a pixel matching technology to transform the photo pixels into discrete, color identified, geographically referenced data points representing the photograph surface. Those are points that have coordinates attached to them as well as uh, as color um, identifiers. So this results in a point cloud that can be used to build a digital terrain model um, and uh, a virtual model of the surfaces that you flew over and uh, that can be used, that can be exported into CAD programs or GIS uh, programs and used for designing or mapping or uh, analysis or measurement or any number of things. So here's a look at a takeoff. Performs several onboard checks to let you know when it's ready to take off and uh, and you just pitch it in the air and it's on its way to its first waypoint that's been programmed into it. And this is what it looks like while you're flying it on the ground. This is the control center on my laptop. Um, there's flight commands up above and you can see the little airplane going from waypoint to waypoint. Those are all editable in real time. It can be uh, moved, um, deleted, added. Um, you have full control over the airplane at all times. Um, that's the flight data that's transmitted back from the airplane. Uh, that's heading, airspeed, altitude, and uh, attitude, and uh, battery conditions, and all sorts of information. We're going to take a look at uh, a few case studies to give you an idea of what I've been talking about here. Um, this first one is a gravel pit that was flown uh, to establish a baseline topography. Um, we flew this before a crushing contract was going to take place in the pit so that we would know what the ground was before they started crushing and so we could measure quantities after they were done. So this is a baseline of the area. Um, we surveyed 168 acres. Uh, ground sampling distance, average ground sampling distance, they call that uh, GSD, is 1.42 inches. So about an inch and a half, a little less than an inch and a half. Um, the ground was sampled with a pixel. Uh, actual flight time was 32 minutes and 37 seconds. And we took 385 photos during that flight. Um, the computer took about eight hours to produce the point cloud from that. Um, as you can imagine, that's fairly in-depth, complicated um, computations that it has to do. And uh, the, the real takeaway from this is down here at the bottom. This flight generated 38,347,000. 544 3D data points. So 38 million points in about 32 minutes. You know, if, if information is power, 
and time is money, this is the best ratio that I think I've ever seen in my life. It, it's just incredible to me that that much information can be collected in that short a time. And this is what it looks like. The, the results are just nothing short of. It's important to remember while we're looking at this that uh, to remind yourself this isn't photography that we're looking at. This is a point cloud. And this isn't the actual flight of the drone that we're looking at. This is a uh, virtual trajectory that I designed and put through in the computer to fly over this point cloud. This point cloud was generated from those 38 million points. That's what we're looking at here is those 38 million points uh, that were captured in 32 minutes of flight. Um, you can see the incredible amount of information that's captured here, the detail. Um, it's just phenomenal to be able to get terrain information this precise, this quickly. Um, and, you know, the implications for um, engineering is just staggering. Um, we have so much more information and it is so much more accurate than ever available before and it's so quickly uh, captured that it's just it's revolutionary this is a look at the point cloud uh, before the crushing contract and from the same vantage point after the con uh, crushing contract you can see some piles appeared and uh, you can sort of make out how uh, this point cloud is uh, you can see the little individual individual dots if you look closely and so we were able to measure the quantities of those piles and uh, I colorized them here so they'd stand out and we'd know what we were measuring exactly and you can see very clearly what we measured and how well it was modeled to measure um, those shapes. Um, we knew very closely the volumes in those piles um, from this information. Much uh, orders of magnitude more accurate than uh, ever before available. And you can see how those piles are situated and um, any sort of issues we might have around them. Um, we've got a, a very clear idea of, of uh, what happened after that crushing contract. And I'm sort of stating the obvious here, but uh, it bears repeating. And using tens or hundreds of thousands of points, or even millions of points, for your calculations compared to maybe a few hundred points that would be collected by the current standard methods of surveying, translates into a quantum leap in volume measurement accuracy. And in truth, accuracy in whatever you're measuring. And this is what I'm talking about. This is what I mean about uh, quantum leap. Um, this is a representation of a pile. This is a digital terrain model, actually, a DTM, we call it, of a material pile. And it was, uh, at, you see uh, several triangles there at the uh, vertices of those triangles are points that were collected by GPS surveying. Um, this is sort of an aerial view. The, the horizontal lines sort of wrap around that thing are, uh, are contours. So those are, I believe they're uh, one foot contour lines or maybe two foot contour lines. At any rate, um, you can see this is how we would have represented that pile to measure the volumes in it. Um, in the past. 
This is that same pile as surveyed by the UAV, the drone. And you can see it's much more accurate. Um, all of the nuances of the pile are captured. You can see the vertical surfaces, um, little ridges. You can almost make out individual rocks. Um, the point cloud representing this pile uh, was around 500,000 points. I believe actually it was uh, 508,000 points in that neighborhood. Um, on the, in the previous slide with the GPS, that was about 150 points. Um, I think you'll agree this represents reality much closer. So here's another case study. Um, this is a landfill that we flew to just uh, get a photographic record of the current conditions. Um, we weren't actually interested in the topography or anything, although we did collect, uh, uh, generate a point cloud from this. Just since we flew it, we might as well get the data. We mapped uh, 73 acres, and our float total flight time was 12 minutes and 6 seconds. Um, we took 125 photos, and uh, the computer took about four hours to process the the uh, all of the photos and stitch them all together into an ortho mosaic um, that I'll show you here in a few minutes. Um, just in that 12 minutes, though, we generated 22 million points. This is. A Google Earth image of the uh, the landfill. Um, this is if you called up Google Earth on your computer and navigated here and looked at it. This is what you would be seeing. This is our ortho mosaic that we generated from our flight, and I just dropped it into uh, Google Earth and overlaid it in there, and you can see that it fits perfectly. Um, it's uh, much better resolution than the satellite imagery, though. Here's an example of that resolution, of the photo resolution. And you can see off to the right there, the lower right, there's a palette. And, you know, if, if you had to, you could probably count the tires that are in this landfill at this point. Um, this is much better imagery than is available by satellite, at least commercially available by satellite. And uh, and it's fresh. It's um, on this particular day we flew this and this is the imagery we have. You don't have to wait for, for uh, satellites or Google Earth to publish their imagery to see what's there. You can have it the next day. This is another example. Um, this is a topographic survey that we performed for a proposed road realignment. Um, this is a county road that uh, there were some issues with some bridges on the county road, and uh, they determined that it was more cost effective to move the road and realign it to a different place than it was to um, put money into fixing the bridges. So uh, we mapped the area that they were going to reroute the road through. Uh, it's 76 acres. We took uh, 26 minutes, 26 and a half minutes of flight time, 269 photos, and this job uh, took about eight hours to generate the point cloud, uh, somewhere north of 42 million points. And this is a fly through that point cloud. Once again, keep in mind that this is a, a cloud of points that we're looking at here. It's not uh, photography or video. Um, at points you can, at certain times you can sort of see through. It looks like it's a little translucent. That's because these points are the surface of the Earth that 
they represent the surface of the earth and you're actually looking through the point cloud when you see that those sorts of things um, the other amazing thing about doing these surveys is all of this data is captured at once um, it's it's like uh, taking a the field and putting it in your briefcase and bringing it back to the office we we can uh, we capture data that we didn't even know we wanted and you know for in the future um, we have information that that uh, um, we may not even not have known that we needed it um, we could use this information for say uh, a hydraulic analysis to to uh, design culverts with um, or check drainages with uh, we could use this for asset management purposes for the county roads so they could um, keep track of the assets that are within their right-of-ways um, we could use this for uh, vegetation analysis we could use this information for uh, any number of things um, you know we, we could measure the striping intervals on the highway that we overflew there if we wanted to um, that's all information that's just captured and less time than it takes to eat a lunch this is a um, contour map that I generated from that uh, survey that we just showed you um, I generated this in AutoCAD and those are two foot contour intervals um, if you're familiar with how contours work um, each one of those lines represents an uh, even elevation and the, each one is separated by two feet so and the red ones would be um, 10 feet I believe um, over to the right you can see the proposed center line for the new road um, it snowed on this project about uh, a week after we'd flown it and we decided to go out and fly it again just to see what the snow did to the data and uh, just as an experiment now keep an eye on these contours and I'll show you those are the white contours are the contours that were generated after it snowed um, it snowed about uh, two to three tenths of a foot um, so about three inches and you'll see those contours are they register about three tenths of a foot offset from the from the uh, previous contours just as you would expect so it shows that terrain about three inches higher there um, this showed me that um, this data is very reliable and very reproducible um, it's uh, it gave me a great deal of confidence in the data that we're generating from this from this technology this is another case study uh, this is a, a light rail corridor it's a, a, actually an old railroad and they're going to repurpose it for a light rail in Denver um, we surveyed this approximately six miles of corridor we did it in uh, five flights that I did on two separate days um, that were about three weeks apart uh, our combined time for all five of the flights was one hour and 11 minutes so 71 minutes and uh, number of total photos 665 uh, the common the combined total of all of these flights generated 112 million points almost and uh, I apologize this is going to be another fly through uh, when I prepared this presentation um, I was told I was going to be limited on time so I had to accelerate this one um, it's uh, but I thought it was important to show the entire um, corridor to show what uh, the amount of data there was that could be captured in an hour's worth of work but uh, 
since this is accelerated, we're going to be flying through at something close to 200 miles an hour. So, so hold on. This is traveling from south to north. So this is an abandoned bridge over the South Platte River there. And uh, at certain times you'll see a couple of trucks parked here. There, there they are. Uh, that's me. That's where I was flying this from. And you'll see me pop up quite a few times down this corridor here. Um, this is 88th and Welby that we just crossed there. Um, you can see all of the terrain that was captured here. This saved weeks and weeks of surveying along this corridor. There I am again. That's Thornton Parkway that we just crossed there. And uh, there I am again. I believe that's 104th there. That's Colorado Boulevard off to the right that we passed there. And we're coming up on some active construction area there, so we're flying through some equipment and stockpiles. We have all the volumes of the stockpiles, by the way, um, if anybody cares to know what was available in those stockpiles on that date. Um, we have it there. I'm very thankful that we could survey that very large fill area there by a drone and so I don't have to walk up and down those slopes so there you have it six miles of railroad corridor in just over an hour's worth of work this is another flyby that I included just because I never get tired of looking at this stuff it just is absolutely stunning to me to be able to see this much data captured in just such a short amount of time this is a post construction fly through of uh, after a uh, some flood mitigation work that was done on the city near the city park in lander um, that's a walk bridge that we just flew under uh, you'll notice that occasionally you see areas of dark patches um, those were uh, those are where there's dense vegetation um, the uh, if the camera can't see it then it, there's no data there so those are just gaps in the data from dense vegetation and uh, also too um, there's um, vertical surfaces you'll see um, some walls and things missing. That's uh, there's different techniques of capturing data on vertical surfaces, but that isn't what we were after here with this survey. We're interested in the topography of the river, so um, that's why those show up. Um, we were actually able to get the topography of the river bed through the water. Um, that surprised me a bit, but uh, we actually can generate contours of the riverbed through the water. Here's an example of the resolution again um, of that survey. One of the photos of that survey, this is the walk bridge um, that we flew under. And you can see that uh, where boulders were specifically placed as part of this construction area. and you can see uh, all the way down to the to the bottom of the river there, um, since it's shallow and and, and uh, relatively calm when we flew it. Um, if you needed to, you could count the boulders, and it turns out that in some areas, that's actually what they needed. They needed to count the boulders, so this worked out very well for our client. This is uh, a county road that we uh, flew to just photograph um, so we could get a photographic record of uh, the condition of the road. Um, it's 1.8 miles and uh, we also wanted to demonstrate that we could uh, survey on 
long, narrow corridors efficiently. So this was an 11 minute, 17 seconds of flight time to generate the uh, ortho photo mosaic strip that follows this road. Um, the road actually is uh, in the upper right hand corner of this photo. This is Google Earth photo. Um, the road runs from that intersection south and sort of curves around to the east and ends on the bottom right where there's kind of a Y intersection there. This is the photo mosaic that we generated um, and overlaid into Google Earth there of that road. And here's an example of the resolution for this uh, of that survey. You can see uh, for the county road engineers, um, having this information is is uh, really valuable. Uh, we can see conditions of culverts here. Um, there, um, the one on the right is actually a head gate, so we can tell the condition of the head gate and then the condition of the ditches there. We can tell the condition of the cattle guards, how full it is, uh, what the conditions of the wings on the cattle guards are. Um, we can see some distresses on the road. And uh, here's another view of the uh, road service. And you can see that we can actually measure the distresses on the road. For example, we can identify and measure transverse cracking in, on the road. And uh, in this way, we can show the, uh, the county road engineers the condition of that roadway. You can see they have some edge cracking issues there that we can identify. Um, in this way, they can know what the condition of their pavement is, which is an enormous asset. Um, it's a huge amount of, of the uh, worth of the county roads is in the asphalt. That's by and large the most expensive asset that they have on their inventory. So uh, knowing the condition of it and being able to marshal their resources to deal with the, the uh, repairs or the, the maintenance of those roads efficiently is critical and this is a valuable tool for that. And that's all I had um, at this time. I thank you for letting me share our excitement with you uh, and I am indeed excited. It, it's uh, I feel very blessed and uh, honored and um, lucky to be a part of yet another revolution in the surveying world and, and being able to work with this technology. So thank you very much.